that we must understand that Holocaust is not only about six million Jews that perished. Holocaust is about racism, loss of freedom, loss of dignity, humiliation, loss of education, confiscation of property, enslavement, starvation, torture, mass execution, and of course the final solution to the Jewish question, which was decided at the Wannsee Conference in Germany on the 20th of January, uh, 1942. Fifteen high-ranking officials and some uh, uh, high-ranking uh, officers sat at a table. Uh, they had a five-star dinner. They smoked the best cigar, they drank the best brandy, and within less than two hours, they decided the fate of the entire Jewish population of Europe, which numbered at the time about 11 million. Here in Ireland, there were 4,000. Thankfully, the Germans never reached Ireland, so they were uh, saved. But unfortunately, they succeeded to kill uh, 6 million. I'm, of course, talking about the Jews, but there were many others that perished during that period. I grew up in a little village called Merasice in Slovakia, in central Slovakia, about 100 kilometers from Bratislava. It was a farming community. My father was a farmer. My grandfather had the village shop. I have very fond memory from the village. I remember in the summer we used to run barefoot, and in winter we used to toboggan. For me, the village was like a, a little paradise, just like the villages here in Ireland. Everything was free, and uh, we had a very nice life. Of course, uh, everybody knew my parents. When I researched my book, I discovered that already in late 1700, our family already lived in Slovakia. So we lived there for generations. That was our country. We didn't know any other country. We never felt any discrimination. And quite opposite, if anybody needed any help or advice, they always had the address, go to the Reichenthal. They will be able to advise you uh, whether they needed a good lawyer or a good doctor or even some help. Uh, the family was always uh, there and uh, any event that was in the village, whether it was wedding or funeral, uh, my parents, my father would participate. Uh, they were invited to all these events. My grandfather even served on the committee of the village. So we were integrated in the life of the village. We felt our country was Slovakia, we were Slovak citizens. But all this began to change in 1939. When Germany occupied the Czech Republic, they annexed Sudetenland, and they also imposed a puppet government in Slovakia. The government was not elected, but the German imposed a puppet government, which was, of course, uh, sympathetic to the German regime in Germany. Uh, the president of Slovakia was a Roman Catholic priest. His name was Joseph Tiso. He was an anti-Semite. He didn't like the Jews. And he surrounded himself with nationalists. Eventually, he became a dictator of Slovakia. And uh, uh, he was alienated. Uh, and it, it uh, uh, culminated, which I will talk later in uh, trying to remove him, but uh, he was very friendly with the Nazi regime in Germany. His government was a fascist government, a dictatorial government, and therefore Slovakia joined the Japanese-German axis, which meant that any time Slovakia needed help, Germany help, and vice versa. When the war broke out in 1939 on the Polish border, Slovakia served the Germans very well uh, because through Slovakia 
they transported the ammunition, uh, the heavy equipment, tanks and guns and manpower to the Polish border where they were fighting uh, the war. And that was very useful for Slovakia at the time because Slovakia did not have much of an industry, uh, so economically it was very beneficial because the German uh, paid for this uh, service. So because of this friendship and cooperation between Slovakia and Germany, Slovakia in fact was not occupied by German army, but the rest of Europe was being occupied by Germany and the German even used it as uh, their PR, the propaganda, that if a nation is friendly uh, with Germany, they have no interest to occupy. But uh, of course, uh, because of the uh, propaganda that the government was spreading against the Jews, they blamed the Jews for everything that went wrong in Slovakia, slowly uh, the uh, attitudes of our Jewish people in Slovakia uh, began to be of hatred. It didn't take long before the Slovak government introduced the first racial laws. It was called the Jewish Codex. It had 270 paragraphs restricting the life of the Jews. At the time, uh, because of the uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, um, at the time we didn't have the uh, information system, the lack of information systems, especially in the rural areas. Uh, hardly ever a newspaper arrived there. Usually people that were passing through the village and would go to the pub, they used to tell the people what is happening outside. So the government propaganda at the time was spread through the churches. They, uh, at the masses, they blamed the Jews for everything that went wrong in Slovakia. If the harvest wasn't good, they said it was the fault of the Jews. So that's how they began to build uh, the hatred against the Jews. People didn't have any facilities. So if you had a radio in a village, you were considered a middle class. People had no uh, connection to the outside world like we have uh, today. So when the Jewish Codex was introduced in September 1941, uh, there were 270 paragraphs restricting the Jewish life. I just will uh, mention several of these things. Uh, we had to wear a yellow star on uh, our on the left side any time that we left the house. We were not allowed to go to national school. Uh, we were not allowed to go to any public places like cinema, theater, swimming pool, uh, public park. Uh, we were uh, restricted um, uh, our movement. We were not allowed to travel. We had to have permits and. Um, there were also some silly restrictions, like the Jewish people had to be at certain time in the evening in the houses. They were not allowed to be out before certain time. Uh, employment, uh, Jewish people were uh, thrown out of their jobs. So the life for Jews began to be quite difficult. I want to show you a page from a newspaper. It was People's Newspaper. And this is dated to uh, September 1941, just after the Jewish Codex was introduced. And I just laid you a couple of the headlines, the last stall for the Jews. The stricted racial law against the Jews are Slovak. In certain aspects, the Slovak anti-Jewish laws are stricter than the German one. In other words, Slovakia was proud what they did against their own citizens. We were Slovak citizens. We lived there for generations, and suddenly we found ourselves strangers in our own land. You could see here a, a caricature uh, showing a Jews falling out and a Jew is looking out, uh, signifying that the legal law no longer covered the Jews. 
So you can imagine after headline like this, uh, many Jews were being beaten up on the street and uh, there were a couple of fatalities as well. Uh, many synagogues were born down. Slogans were being written on Jewish businesses not to buy there, they belonged to Jews. So <clears throat> it was a very frightening time at the time. Of course, I didn't know anything about it for a simple reason that my parents didn't want it to frighten me. I was at the time six year old, just a little boy, very skinny, and uh, we didn't wear the yellow star in the village because everybody knew us anyway, and there was no police to enforce the uh, law. So I had no idea what is happening outside. We have to realize at the time to be six year old, we were very innocent. It's not like today, a six year old, I know it from my uh, granddaughter, she comes with such news to me, uh, what is happening in the world, and I sometimes wonder how she knows all these things. We didn't know what was happening beyond the village. Here a six year old knows what is happening all over the world. So the innocence was just, um, just we didn't feel anything, we just enjoyed our life, but of course, once the Jewish Codex uh, came out, I started to go to school in the, in the village, which was a national school, but because I was Jewish, I was thrown out. And I had to go to the neighboring town where there was, uh, it was called Nitra, not far from where, about, uh, I think it was about half an hour on a train or something. And uh, there was quite a large Jewish population, about 5,000 people, so there were several uh, Jewish schools, and I was brought to my aunt, and uh, I started to go to school in the town. Of course, in the town, because the Jewish people lived in certain part of the town, the community hall was near, the synagogue was near, the school was near. And as the evening before I was going to school, I saw my aunt showing the yellow star on my coat. It was about the size you can see here, 10 centimeters in diameter. And I asked, what is that for? And she said, well, we are Jewish. We have to wear a yellow star. And in my innocence, I didn't ask why and what we have to wear it, so I didn't care, you know, as a kid. And uh, my aunt went with me a couple of times. I mean, the school was about two, three hundred yards from where we lived. So after two days or three days, she said, you know where the school is, you can go on your own. And that was the time for the first time that I realized I'm different to the other kids, because when I was going on the street, and opposite there were coming children without a yellow star, they started to shout at me, you dirty Jew, you smelly Jew, and all kind of insults that I can't even mention. And I suddenly realized I'm something I couldn't understand why. I never harmed anybody, I never did anything bad, and uh, people are hating me as the time was going on, they become more aggressive, they would try to spit at me and then throwing stone after me. So I remember every day I used to run to the school and run back and any time I saw children without the yellow star, obviously they were Gentiles, I would just try to go on to the other side of the road so that they uh, don't catch me. They did a couple of times and they gave me a couple of kicks in my backside and let me go. So I can tell you it was very frightening uh, for a, a six-year-old to be uh, treated on a street like this. Uh, frightening all the time that something will happen to me. And as the time was going on, they were more aggressive towards me. I used to come uh, to my aunt crying and I would say, I, I, I don't want to go to school because i have being abused on the way. But of course it wasn't an option. I had to go to school and endure this, uh, this uh, uh, 
aggressionate towards me. At the time, in 1941, also a representative for Germany uh, joined the German embassy in Slovakia. His name was Dieter Wislicen. He was a high-ranking officer. He came basically to gather the information about the Jews of Slovakia. At the time in Slovakia, there were between 85 to 90,000 Jews living about uh, 3% of the population. He was gathering the information where they lived, uh, what professions they were, what businesses they are, all the relevant uh, questions that the German government wanted to know because they had obviously planned for later on. Dieter Wislicenio also later became advisor to the Slovak government on Jewish affairs. At the time, many Slovak young men and women walked in Germany. It is estimated over 100,000 volunteers walked in Germany to help with the war effort. They walked in, in ammunition factory, in engineering, a concern where they were manufacturing the heavy equipment. So that was also very beneficial for Slovakia because uh, these young men and women sent their wages home and that's helped uh, to the Slovak uh, economy. So there was a great cooperation, but the uh, uh, regime of Slovakia was a fascist regime. Tiso became a, a dictator many Slovaks were suffering under his regime. Uh, anybody that belonged to different political outlook was being arrested, sometime never seen again. Anybody that spread rumors again, uh, the government was being arrested. So the Slovak people began to hate the Tiso regime. And uh, Germany uh, came to Slovakia again and requested another 20,000 volunteers to come to work in Germany to help with the war reform. But not many came forward because, as I said, they didn't listen anymore to the regime. They hated the uh, fascist regime. So it was very embarrassing to Tissot that he couldn't serve his master in Berlin. But some of his... Uh, 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 nationalists in the government went to Wislicenia and said, look, there are not many volunteers coming forward. What about if we give you young Jewish men and women to work in Germany or Poland, wherever you need them, as slave labor? And Wislicenia went to Berlin, he consulted with his superior, and he came back and said that the German government agrees to this arrangement. And so, towards end of 1941, beginning of 1942, the first arrest of young Jewish men and women began. At the time, actually, the young Jewish men and women were not frightened because there was no uh, notification that they will go out of Slovakia, they thought they will be working in Slovakia, and because they were long time out of jobs, they were thrown out. There, there was actually a jovial atmosphere. I remember when we accompanied my cousin and, uh, to the uh, meeting places where they were being picked up. They were singing, and we were laughing and joking, uh, because they said, at least now, we will become useful citizens, we will be working, and we will be earning our own upkeep. They didn't know at the time that they will be taken away. And in the end, we said goodbye to them. We didn't cry for them or anything. We just said that all this will be over, we will be reunited and everything will be okay. But unfortunately, we never saw them again. So at the time, I lost several of my uh, cousin, and uh, I knew them very well because on the uh, annual holiday when they were going to school, they used to come to the village, I used to play with them, I knew them and uh, I still remember them very well, and not realizing they were lovely people, 
that when we said goodbye to them, it was last time uh, we saw them. So the deportation began and um, eventually also uh, the, the government realized uh, that if all these young Jewish men and women will be taken away, Slovakia would be left with the mother and children and the old people and they will have to look after them because the uh, breadwinners were being taken away. So there was a delegation again uh, that went to, to uh, Wislicene, a large Slovak delegation, and said, you know, you're taking the young Jewish men and women, you might as well take all the Jews of Slovakia away because otherwise it will be a great burden on the government to look after the families. And so a delegation, uh, Slovak and a German, went to Berlin and they reached an agreement among other people. There at the meeting was Adolf Eichmann. You might have heard about him. He was the man that uh, organized the transport to this extermination camp. At that uh, uh, meeting, they made agreement. There were several paragraphs in the agreement. I'm going to only mention two of them, which are very unique. First of all, the Germans demanded 500 mark from the Slovak government for every Jew they will take from Slovakia. Uh, this uh, money they claim was a resettlement money. In other words, the Jews, when they will be taken away, they will have to taught uh, some work to do, they have to be clothed, they have to be fed, and for that, the 500 mark will cover the expense. Why do I mention uh, this particular paragraph? Because it was a unique arrangement. No other country in Europe ever paid a German for taking the Jews away. The only country that paid the German was Slovakia, and that was done, of course, under a president who was a Roman Catholic uh, priest, Joseph Tiso. It was under his uh, leadership. The second part that was in this agreement uh, was that any Jew taken out of Slovakia had to be stripped of her or his Slovak citizenship. This was very important for the German because it meant once the Jews crossed the border, the Slovak government had no jurisdiction. What will happen to these people? Of course, today we know what happened to them. At the time, Mostly people were taken away that were not useful, I'm not talking people, Jewish people, that were not useful to the Slovak economy. In other words, small shopkeepers, government employees, uh, men that were discharged from the Slovak army. These people were being uh, taken away. Anybody that was useful to the economy, uh, at the time got a document that he should be exempt for this uh, particular time. Because my father was a farmer, he was considered useful to the economy. So we had this uh, special document exempting us from being deported at the time. And that's why in the first phase of deportation from Slovakia, we were spared. But at the time, as the uh, deportation started, which went from March uh, 1942 till October. In October, the deportation suddenly stopped. I'm not going to go into the detail why it stopped, because it just would take too long. But during this six-month period, 52 transport left Slovakia, each transport between 1,000 and 1,500 Jews. All together, 58,000 Jewish people were deported from Slovakia, according to the statistic after the war, only between uh, 280 and 500 survived. Rest of them all perished in the Holocaust. Among them, over 30 members of my family. I remember when my aunt were going, taken away, we hardly even cry for them. We just said goodbye and said when all will be over, 
we will be reunited. I remember in July they come from my grandparents, from my father's side. We cried a little bit and we said when it's over we will be reunited. Not realizing that it was for the last time we saw them. Of course during this time our teachers were taken away as well. So I remember it was about February 1942 when we were told that the school is closing because the teachers were taken away, they were Jewish, and we can go home. And so my education ended. The next time I went to school was in <coughs> towards the end of 1945, after the war. So from 1942 to 1945, my basic education I lost when I started to go to school. I was 10 years old at the time. I had to sit with six, seven-year-old children in the classes because I couldn't write, I couldn't read, I couldn't do any mathematics. I had to start from scratch. You can imagine at that age, one year, make a huge difference. So it was very embarrassing for me as a 10-year-old sitting with six, seven-year-old uh, kids in a, a class, but I had to uh, work very hard to sort of catch up with my own age. It took about 18 months. In the end, uh, thank God, I didn't do badly. I uh, attended uh, college and uh, qualified as diploma engineer and uh, did quite well in my adult life. But uh, uh, I never forget that period uh, that I had to endure. When the uh, deportation stopped, we were living in our village, but still Jewish people were being arrested uh, because uh, uh, the government claimed it's for their own protection uh, because the Jewish people were abused outside. And at the time already, the news were filtering what was happening that about the gas chamber. In fact, the Slovak Jewry were the first Jews gassed in uh, Birkenau, Auschwitz. At the time, the uh, deportation was delayed by about two weeks because the gas chamber were not ready. So the Jews of Slovakia were the first Jews uh, that were being gassed in Auschwitz. So when we said goodbye to my grandparents, uh, hoping we will see them, uh, perhaps within a couple of days, maybe a week or two. They ended up in Auschwitz in Birkenau and they were uh, gas. <coughs> so at the time, after the deportation stopped, people, Jewish people, did not believe the Slovak government, what they were saying and therefore the Jews were trying to hide in any way, not to be arrested because they didn't believe that uh, eventually uh, they will be uh, deported. So they did uh, various things, they converted their religion, uh, which wouldn't have helped them anyway because they, they closed this loophole in Slovakia and said the only people that will be converted uh, they will recognize the conversion if they were converted before 1922. So many did convert and when they caught them, uh, they were not, not spared either. And then later on, even the converts before 1922, many of them uh, perished uh, later on in this uh, process. So uh, people used to hide in various bunkers and the houses uh, they pay the people to keep them there uh, to avoid arrest. And I remember at the time, many times, the police was on the way to our village and we would get a phone call from the neighboring village to hide because the police is on the way. It was the Hlinka Guard, it was the Slovak police responsible arresting the Jews. So we would lock the house and run to the uh, cornfield and we would stay there the whole day and return in the evening when the police left and they probably informed the superior that the house was closed we were not home 
Uh, many times we didn't have time to go to the cornfield, so we would go to a, a, a barn that we had in the farm and in the attic where we dried the corn. We had a place with blankets and some water and food, and we would climb on a ladder up and then pull the ladder up. And even our employees in the farm didn't know that we were hiding in the attic there in the evening. Uh, we were told that the police left. So the people actually helped us and notified us because they didn't cooperate with the government. They hated the government, so we got uh, quite a help. But we didn't know who was our friend in the village and who was our enemy in the village. But there were many that uh, were uh, very helpful and uh, help us along. Sometimes we even had to sleep in the houses of our employees because there was rumor that the police will be uh, hunting Jews during the night. So we slept in our employees' houses and it was very heroic of them to take us in because if they found out that they were hiding Jews, they would have been very severely punished for it. So this was sort of a over two years that we had a, a sort of a hide and see with the police. You never knew what going to happen in the evening. We would switch off the light in the house and when the dog was barking outside, we would keep very uh, quiet. And if somebody knocked on the door, we pretended that we were not in the house. So it was very frightening time uh, because we were afraid that uh, we might be surprised suddenly the police will come. Actually, it's happened once or twice, and my father had to bribe them uh, with money, tell them, look, go away for half an hour and come back. And during that half an hour, we would lock the house and uh, go to the barn or something so they could say to the superior uh, that uh, we were not home. But it cost a lot of money to do this. Uh, to avoid arrest, because I said, at the time we knew if we were arrested, uh, something terrible uh, could happen to us. But the uh, Slovak people hated the Tiso regime. They suffered after this uh, uh, from his uh, dictatorial ways that he was uh, managing the country. and. Uh, it all burst out on the 29th of August 1944 uh, when there was an uprising in Slovakia. The Slovak people rebelled against Tiso. Many soldiers defected from the army, joined the rebellion. Police defected from the police force, joined the rebellion. And so Tiso had no power to suppress this uprising. And therefore, for the first time, Germany occupied Slovakia. Not because they wanted to occupy Slovakia, but because they wanted to save the Tiso regime, which was a sympathetic regime, to Germany. Of course, they succeeded, and within three weeks, the rebellion was suppressed. Unfortunately, in this rebellion, uh, many Slovak lost their life. It is as estimated that within three weeks, over 15,000 young Slovak men and women lost their life fighting the regime. And of course, later, uh, the German army, they lost it after three weeks. The rebellion was suppressed, and uh, but the rebellion still sort of uh, resistance uh, continued afterwards. Unfortunately, with their German army, also units of Adolf Eichmann arrived. It was the Gestapo. And the remainder of the Jews knew that once the German occupied Slovakia, the Jewish people are doomed in Slovakia, and uh, there was terrible uh, panic. And we realized if we stayed in the village, sooner or later somebody will betray us uh, because the uh, Gestapo and the Slovak police joined forces. They become very efficient. They put uh, a spy in the villages and town to spy on the remainder 
about 25,000 Jews that were still in Slovakia. So we had to leave the village and um, the problem was that with a name like Reichenthal we wouldn't have got very far because it was a German name. But we were not German, so if we were stopped, they would have known that we were Jewish. We were at every crossroad, every train station, they were all police, and when you were traveling, you were stopped, and you had to identify yourself. Specifically, they wanted to catch up these, these people that participated in the uprising, and of course, they wanted to catch the Jews as well. So we needed false paper. As it happened, my family was very friendly with the local priest. His name was Ladislav Harangozo. He was a good man that uh, socialized with my parents. He did not preach hatred in the church. He preached Christianity and he even suggested one time to my mother, he said, you know, it's very difficult to be Jewish. Why don't you convert? I will uh, make the conversion, but as I mentioned, it wouldn't have helped us because they wouldn't have recognized that conversion anyway. You had to be converted before 1922. But this time, when all the occupation happened, my mother said to the uh, priest, uh, Father Harangozo, you wanted to help us, we need help, we need false paper, can you get us false paper? And he said he will. And within a couple of days, he got us a paper with a typical Slovak name, Vida. Vida was a typical Slovak name, just like in Ireland you would have Connor or Murphy. It's a typical Slovak, uh, the, uh, Irish name. So I can assure you there is no Jewish family in Ireland called Murphy or, 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 or Connor. So that's uh, uh, Vida, and I remember it very well because my parents were drilling this uh, to, m to me every day. They would say to me, from today, your name is Thomas Vida, not Thomas Reichenthal. If you say Reichenthal, we will be betrayed and terrible things will happen to us. So they, every day, several times, so I still even today remember the vividly the name and so we were preparing to go uh, to live somewhere else which was organized in a village and that we will go there and pretend we were gentile but uh, father harangozo said you know your children will have to go to the national school in the village they couldn't just roam the place and not attend school because uh, this was against the law and if they don't know anything about the Roman Catholic religion, because Slovakia is a very Roman Catholic state, was then and is still today, <coughs> the children will know very quickly that they are not Roman Catholic. So they should come to me before you leave, and I will teach them the basic uh, thing. And I remember with my brother, it must have been about two or three weeks, we went every day to Father Harangozo, uh, for about four hours and he would teach us the prayer that the children pray before the school started about the various holiday in the Roman Catholic calendar about station of the cross uh, how to cross ourselves how to make a grace all these little things so we were not totally ignorant when we go to the school and we can sort of get involved in uh, when the religious classes were in the education. And it was uh, uh, <coughs> end of September, beginning of October, that we left the village. It was my mother, my brother and myself. My father stayed behind. He had to look after the livestock, after the farm. He said, I have plenty of friends in the uh, village, they will uh, look after me, they will contact me if somebody is on the way. I will be all right. You go to Bratislava and from there you go uh, to this new place. And we went to Bratislava, my mother and my brother and myself, we could move. We had a false paper, nobody uh, bothered to uh, 
ask us anything, we identify ourselves. Uh, it was uh, with the name like Vida, uh, we were quite uh, safe. In uh, Bratislava, my mother uh, was picking up her mother, my grandmother, and she was coming with us into this village. In the meantime, we heard, we were only a couple of days in Bratislava, that my father was arrested. At the time, my mother thought, that's it, we will never see my father, because at the time already the adult among us knew about the gas chamber, about the mass execution, and she, they thought that's what will happen to him. Uh, but after several days, we received a postcard from my father. There were four words, I'm alive, don't worry. We never knew where it comes from and what happened to him. But thankfully, after the war, we did, we were reunited. He managed to jump from a, a moving train that was taking him probably uh, to Auschwitz or Birkenau. He joined the resistance army, the partisan in Slovakia, fought against the German till end of the war and thankfully survived. I have to mention that what the uh, father Harangozo did for us at the time, if he was found out at the time uh, that he gave us false paper, that he taught Jewish children, he wouldn't have been put on trial. He would have been taken out of the church, put against the wall, and he would have been shot because it was such a crime. And I went to Slovakia, of course, many times. It was about 40 years later from here, visited there. I went to the village and I went to the uh, cemetery and I uh, prayed uh, respect to Father Harango. So he died in 1976, uh, thanking him what he tried to do. Even though in the end it didn't help us. But we were in Bratislava, it was on the 16th of October 1944 that my mother went to pick up my grandmother and she left my brother and myself in a, a shop about 300 yards from where my grandmother was waiting and she said on the way back, I will pick you up, we go to the train station and we go to this new place where we will start a new life. But my mother never came back. Uh, because when she entered the shop, she suddenly saw a lot of police there. She saw several of her brother and sister. She saw her mother. She was beaten up. Uh, her face was swollen, black. She knew something terrible happened here. My grandmother was at the time 76 years old. Very old age at the time. Today we think still it's not so old. But at the time they knew that she couldn't look after herself. So they beat her up. She was betrayed by somebody. The police come to the shop and they arrested her. They beat her up because they wanted to know who is looking after her. And she gave the name of her daughter and son. And they were there as well. When my mother saw all this, uh, she pretended she came to collect laundry. It was a laundry shop. And immediately she had to identify herself. So she gave the ID, Judith Vida, that was all right, but uh, born Shaimovich. Now, the priest did not change her maiden name because he thought the Shaimovich was sort of a Hungarian Slovak name. He doesn't need to change it, of course, my grandmother's name was Rosalia Shaimovich. So they knew right away that uh, my mother was her daughter. She was arrested. When they opened the cases that my mother had ready there, they saw, found children close and they said, where are you children? My mother knew if she tried to spin some story, uh, they wouldn't believe her anyway, they will beat her up and in the end she will have to tell them because the Gestapo was law to themselves. They could kill somebody, they didn't need to fill up a, a form like today, police, if they harm anybody, uh, you know, they have to fill up a form, why and what happened. They, have, they were law to themselves, if they needed to get some information, 
one way or another, they got it. And if they didn't get it, the person didn't survive. So she just told them where we were, and the next thing, these two tall men entered the shop. And we knew right away it was the Gestapo, because they had the uniform, which was a long leather coat, long coat, up to the ankle, leather coat. They had swastika on the left arm, hat and Polish boot. They come straight to my brother and said, you Jewish? And my brother said, I'm not Jewish. My name is Miklos Vida, because we thought with a name like Vida, nobody will uh, suspect. Of course, they knew. They asked him two or three times. He still was denying. At the time, my brother was 13 year old. He's uh, four year old, and then me. I was nine year old at the time. And the next thing, they started to beat him up. But he was quite tall for his age. And he said, uh, he wouldn't tell them, he wouldn't admit. So they, they turned around to me and said, but you Jewish? And I said, no, my name is Thomas Vida, I'm not Jewish. And again, they asked me two or three times, and the next thing they were beating me up. Of course, I was crying, I was being hurt, and my brother, he was very protective for me. So when he saw it, he jumped out, he said, please stop beating him. We are Jewish. We were taken to the shop, and there we saw 13 of the family were all, including us, 13 of us were arrested on that day. They simply, from one person to the next, uh, they managed to catch 13 of us on that day. We were taken to the Gestapo headquarters in Bratislava, we stayed there overnight in the cellar. Next morning, we were taken by lorries to uh, a detention camp in Slovakia, detention camp Seren, where they did the selection. Now, I don't know if you heard the word selection, but in the Jewish vocabulary, it's a very frightening word, because in these selections, family were split. And all this happened within seconds. And in 99% of the cases, when they were split, they didn't even couldn't uh, kiss each other or anything. The young men and women went to the right side, mother, children, and all people to the left. At the time, the Jewish people knew exactly what that meant. The people on the right side went to working camp, and they had a chance to survive. The people on the left side, they were just selected and straight taken into uh, extermination camp. And it was on the 2nd of November that we were called to a roll call for the selection. The man that did the selection, his name was Alios Brunner. He was a high-ranking German officer. He uh, did this uh, for, uh, in Hungary. He sent hundreds of thousands to their death, and now he came to Slovakia uh, to finish the remainder of the Slovak jury. Uh, he escaped after the war, and ended up in uh, Syria, and uh, he never stood a trial. Uh, he got away with it. Apparently, he died in uh, 2010, uh, just uh, several years ago. Uh, he got away with it, and the, the German and the Israelis, they were trying to get extradition for him, but of course, because of the, the situation in the mid Middle East, uh, the Syrian wouldn't give him up, and so he got away with it. Alios Bruder st stood there, and family by family went front of him. And uh, we went front, and uh, all of us, we were split, Seven went to the right, and six of us, which was my grandmother, aunt, one of my cousins, my mother, brother, and myself, to the left. So you can imagine the adult among us knew what that meant. I remember at the time when my aunt was split from her husband. She didn't even kiss him, say goodbye. She just uh, said uh, goodbye and... Uh, that was it. We waved to our uncle and aunt, not realizing that, in fact, this is the last time we are seeing them. The seven went, most of them, to Buchenwald 
Samt to Sachsenhausen. Buchenwald was a slave labor camp. The inmates worked in stone quarries in November, December, January. Very uh, cold in northern Germany and uh, with very little food, uh, with disease. The life expectancy in Buchenwald was between two to three months. So unfortunately, out of the seven that went to the right, only one person survived. It was my cousin. He was 15 years old. The rest of them uh, perished in the Holocaust. So when we waved goodbye to them, that was the last time we saw them.